So welcome everybody and thank you very much for taking the time out of your schedules uh, this afternoon to join us. My name is Jane Norman, I'm Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences here at the University of Bristol. And we're delighted today to have Professor Hugh Brady, our Vice-Chancellor, and Professor Adam Finn uh, with us to, to talk about uh, COVID and the university's response to COVID. Before we start, just a few housekeeping items. Um, there will be some time for Q&As at the end. Um, please do use the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen to submit questions and we'll try and get through as many of them as, as we have time for. This uh, broadcast is being recorded uh, and you will receive an email link to the recording in the coming days if, you, if you'd like to watch it again. If you do have technical issues during the presentation, please try and, and log out and log in again. If that doesn't work for you, please uh, email alumni events. So that's alumni-events at bristol.ac.uk and a member of the team will do their best to help you. So this afternoon you'll be hearing from Professor Hugh Brady, our Vice Chancellor and President, who will briefly update you on how COVID-19 has affected Bristol and some of the fantastic alumni support that we have received. And I'll then introduce Professor Adam Finn, who is Professor of Paediatrics and Coordinator of Uncover, uh, which is Bristol's response to the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, to talk about what Bristol has done specifically around research. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, and welcome our Vice-Chancellor and Pro President, Professor Hugh Brady. Hugh. Good, thank you, Jane, and welcome everybody. And thank you for joining us for this uh, very special event. Uh, first and foremost, I, I hope that you and your families and friends are, are all staying safe um, during these these really challenging times uh, for, for the world. Um, we're in Bristol, we're, we're now into our, um, in, in the UK, our, our 11th week uh, of lockdown. And it was now approximately seven weeks ago when we transitioned our uh, entire educational offering and supports uh, online and had to, had to uh, shut down many of our research facilities, but not all, as you'll hear um, over the coming minutes. Um, it's, it's been a challenging time and of course over the last weekend Bristol has been in the news uh, yet again with the, um, or for very different reasons. Um, you, you may have seen the images of, um, of what were actually pe very peaceful protests in the city um, but um, very heartfelt protests against racism and, and which did result in, in, the, um, in, in one um, uh, relatively um, Violent act of the uh, the tearing down of the statue of Colston in the in the city centre, and it ended up as in the floating harbour. Um, it's not something I'm going to talk about ex at all tonight, but uh, but just to say that um, um, it is an interesting time for the city. Um, the, the the city is is I think more actively than ever uh, engaging uh, with its past and and with the history of slavery. And we take this very seriously as a university. We've set very ambitious targets in terms of uh, student recruitment of uh, black and uh, minority students, uh, similarly for staff. And indeed, one of the thought leaders for in, in uh, the university at the moment is our recent uh, hire, Olivet Otelli, who's our, the first uh, uh, professor of the history of slavery in the UK. So you'll be hearing from more, more, more from us uh, on this issue as we consult on student staff and alumni on the way forward over the um, weeks and months ahead. But back to, back to COVID-19, um, it has been uh, a really difficult time, but it has been inspiring to see our university and indeed universities across the world respired, uh, um, respond uh, to the crisis in, in such innovative ways. Um, we literally um, moved all of our educational offering, uh, student and staff supports online within a matter of weeks uh, so that our current students could progress uh, or in the case of the final years graduate and, and I had the privilege of um, um, presiding over one of our most uh, unusual uh, graduations several weeks ago as did Jane when we graduated 200 plus new doctors who 80% of whom chose to, to not only to graduate early but to join the front line uh, and that was uh, great to see. Um, the the transition to online was, was, has been really, really interesting. Um, essentially, COVID-19 in terms of education has de-risked uh, digital innovation. So we had, we had, we had no choice. Uh, we, we either embraced digital technologies uh, to enable our students to continue on their learning journey, 
uh, or, or, or they simply wouldn't have been able to do so. And, and it is interesting, I mean, 10 years ago, probably we couldn't have done this. So it, it does demonstrate the power of uh, digital technologies. We're now focused very much on, on the offering for our students uh, in the 2020-21 academic year. And, um, and we're, we're, we're confident, of course, it depends on the pandemic, but we're, we're confident that we'll be able to offer our students a, what we're calling a, a blended learning experience. So, so the, the very best of face-to-face, -face, the, the experiences that students value most, which are the small group teaching, seminars, laboratories, sessions, one-to-one um, -one mentoring and career guidance. Um, but blending that with the with the the, the best online and and I think all universities are presuming that we will not be in the the position to offer large group lectures in the traditional sense. So what you'll see is that new model of blended learning um, uh, evolve and being offered to our students. But but I think the the outcomes that our students can can expect will not be affected uh, thanks to the uh, the ingenuity and the innovation that we're seeing in our institution and across the sector. Equally impressive and, and the topic for tonight has been the, um, the research response and, and as you know we uh, have one of the um, most distinguished kind of research records in the UK uh, but it's been this, both the scale and the speed of the response that has been uh, so inspiring to witness. Um, it's, it's built on a tradition or a history of, of, of coronavirus research so since approximately 2002, we've had one of the very few UK labs uh, which is uh, licensed to, uh, to handle the live virus. So, so building on that has been a, a really wonderful multidisciplinary effort that has brought together um, virologists, immunologists, vaccinologists, uh, synthetic biologists with colleagues in population health and the social sciences uh, to create a a, a, a team, a multidisciplinary community um, of, of well over 100 really top class researchers. And why it's been a joy for me to watch is I've had nothing to do with it. It, it has been self-forming and self-organizing and driven by the passion and the expertise of those involved. So much of it, I should say, though, has been enabled by the, the generosity of our alumni. And, uh, and it's been it's been really fantastic uh, uh, and inspiring for me to have so many messages of support from alumni from across the UK and across the world. But thank you also to the alumni who've contributed uh, financially to fund the uh, coronavirus, the COVID-19 research, who've contributed to the Hardship Fund, and also to alumni who've made themselves available as volunteers to connect up with the, with our students and mentor their, our students through our Bristol Voices program during these um, very difficult times. So never has our alumni base been more important and your support, your encouragement, advice and wise counsel being, being more important for our university. The multidisciplinary team um, working on COVID-19 uh, goes under the name Uncover, which Jane mentioned, which is the university's COVID-19 emergency research group. It's, it's led, well, he doesn't like, he likes to say he coordinates it, but it's really led by uh, Professor Adam Finn. Um, and Adam is a professor of pediatrics at the university, but also a, an advisor to both the WHO and the UK government. And you've probably heard his contributions on radio, television, and, and other media over the, uh, over the past weeks and months. So Adam, we're really grateful for all that you're doing, not just for the university, but for the national and global, global effort. And I'll hand back over to Jane and Adam so that you can hear more about the work of Uncover. Thank you, Hugh. Thanks. So, so Adam, maybe you can just uh, start, if you don't mind, by telling us how, how Bristol, or the University of Bristol, first responded to the COVID-19 uh, outbreak. Uh, thank you. I'd, I'd first like to start by thanking you for those very kind, flattering words. But, um, uh, and as I say, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm honoured to be holding this effort together, but uh, it's, it's really a very much a joint effort. Um, from my personal perspective, I think the penny dropped uh, at the tail end of February, beginning of March, and, and realised that we needed to essentially stop what we were doing in my lab and uh, redirect our efforts towards uh, coronavirus. Um, it just happens that our lab has all the equipment and expertise for testing for this virus. Um, and so we felt that was the only logical thing to do. 
Um, so ahead of when the shutdown actually happened in mid-March, we were already in the process of doing that. And quite quickly, we, uh, we started having kind of corridor conversations with other colleagues, and most notably Andrew Davidson and David Matthews, who are the two virologists who have been working on this virus, as Hugh mentioned just now, for, for a number of years uh, here in Bristol. Uh, and I, I, it was within a week, really, that I had heard that they were already obtaining the virus and getting going on work. Uh, quite quickly, others began to talk to us. Um, we found ourselves uh, meeting every day, quite quickly, virtually rather than face to face. Um, uh, every day, seven days a week, we were talking and new people were joining, hearing about us and joining in and starting to solve each other's problems and help each other out. And so we felt we needed to give ourselves a name and, and Hughes just told you that we would called ourselves the Bristol Uncover Group. Uh, by now, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, evolved into a, a whole series of subgroups working in different and overlapping areas. And the main group meets three times a week to hear on the progress, the results. Now some really high impact papers coming out of the group uh, already over. I mean, it seems like a long time in some ways, but really it's quite a short period of time that we've been doing this. Um, apart from Andrew uh, and David, none of us were working on coronavirus uh, before the beginning of, uh, of March this year. Um, so uh, that's the way it's, it's worked and of course it wasn't long before uh, Hugh and other senior colleagues uh, became aware that we were uh, active. Uh, Rachel Goodman hill who runs the Elizabeth Blackwell Institute contacted me within the first week and uh, was discussing ways in which they could help support us with funding uh, and then you've heard already about the enormous generosity of alumni which has, has fed that uh, funding both through response mode projects and also a number of items of key equipment which has enabled us to take real leaps forward in the labs in terms of the work that we're doing. So that's the kind of narrative of how it's gone about. It's been a very organic process. Uh, it's been a very exciting process. Bristol's a very collegiate university and I think we all thought we kind of knew each other and uh, were collaborating already and this has opened our eyes to to the fact that there were additional opportunities that we just hadn't imagined uh, for working together. And uh, <clears throat> it's certainly our plan to take that forward into the future, regardless of what may happen with regard to this uh, particular epidemic. I think this has created a, a momentum which we will want to maintain into the future. So it's, it's, it's great to see so many people coming together and, and great to have your leadership in this area. Could you just tell us a little bit more maybe about the, this sort of specific research that, that you and your colleagues are doing around COVID-19? Yeah, yes, yeah, so I'll try and summarise because there are quite a few different things. Uh, I think the, people, the, the thing that people are most aware of is the vaccine trials. That there's one vaccine now which is well advanced uh, ahead of all the others in the field, been developed by colleagues at the University of Oxford. And we in Bristol have been part of a network of clinical trials for vaccines for many years actually, for, ne for nearly two decades, working with Oxford and colleagues in other universities. So uh, we were very quickly approached to help them with developing that uh, program. And in fact, Bristol is the biggest recruiting center to their trials in the country at the moment. We're well into recruiting the phase two, three study of their vaccine. So that's going on in conjunction, of course, with colleagues in the NHS trusts that we partner with. Um, but uh, within the university itself, we also have uh, Andrew and Dave who are right at the center of our laboratory work because they have the virus, which permits all sorts of other people to, to do work as well. Without them, they're the kind of keystone of the effort. Uh, having the virus not only allows, allows us to study it, the virus itself and the genetic evolution of the virus, but also to set up models for, uh, for testing drugs, uh, for immunological work, looking at the immune responses that people are making to the infection and, and beyond just measuring them, actually understanding how and how well they're protecting people and how long that protection lasts. Uh, again, couldn't be done without the virologists. We've got chemists who are experts in aerosols. Uh, and they have techniques available uh, in Bristol, which don't exist anywhere else in the world, in fact. And we've been able to refurbish and put that equipment into class three laboratories in the veterinary school in a very rapid turnaround, actually with help from you, Jane. So thanks for that connection. That's all happened very fast. And we're now uh, just on the threshold of getting results from that work, which will inform uh, all of that uh, area of lack of knowledge around aerosol transmission, 
all of the two meter discussion that's going on at the moment, which is based on very historical work and, and, and very little knowledge that we're going to be able to start providing answers to those kind of questions. And then finally, we have a, a, a biosynthetic um, a laboratory suite here in Bristol, which is really second to none. It's enabled us not only to be able to generate all the antigens, the proteins from the virus that we need in order to do immune tests, looking for antibodies and so on in, in several different labs across the university, but also critically, they have also developed a, a vaccine platform which in fact they had developed last year before this arrived and proved in principle for a, a completely different virus and which has been very rapidly repurposed and we're now doing experiments in vitro and, and uh, experiments in, in rodents as well towards uh, clinical trials in humans. So we have our own vaccine program here in Bristol as well, uh, in addition to being trialists for, for a number of other candidate vaccines uh, coming from other places. Great. So obviously huge amounts of expertise in all, all sorts of different areas and huge technologies coming together. You, you talked a bit about genetic evolution of the virus and, and you know, I'm sure that's really interesting to people who study viruses, but, but, but can you just explain a little bit about the kind of practical applications of that for, for people in the community, people in the health service and, and, and for the rest of the population? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, clearly people are concerned to understand what's happening with this virus as it circulates around the world and within the population, in particular, whether it might change in terms of its infectiousness or in terms of its, uh, its sort of aggressiveness in terms of how it will make people. So, so tracking the virus and changes in the virus is very important. And, uh, and, and Dave and Andrew were one of the first to report uh, important mutations and changes in this virus, which have since been confirmed uh, actually in clinical samples as well. Uh, people may have been listening to Radio 4 this morning and hearing uh, that colleagues in Birmingham, collaborating with colleagues in, in Edinburgh and Cambridge, have produced evidence suggesting that there were something around 1,300 different importations independently of the virus into the UK in late February, early March, probably mostly from Europe. So understanding the genetics of the virus is key to understanding the way it's spreading about. Um, and just this week, we've uh, started having uh, uh, discussions with colleagues in plant, plant biology in the university, which will enable us also to genotype the virus. So in other words, to, to look at the particular strains of virus that we're detecting going forward in our tests. Uh, and the way that will be useful in the future is that if we have outbreaks of infection in the city or in the university, not only will we be able to recognize that the virus is present and and trace the contacts and isolate them. But we will be able to track which exact person was responsible for inf infecting another person because we can tra trace the exact viral strains. And, and that kind of precision will give us much more powerful tools for controlling the spread of infection on, on a local level. Yeah, fantastic. So, so Adam, you, you've obviously been at the centre of a huge uh, Br Bristol effort. Um, you, you know, you, you must have a, a really busy time at the moment. So, so, so how, how do you manage it and what does a typical day look like for you? Do you get any time for anything else? Well, yes, I guess like everyone else, my, my, uh, my life's changed quite a bit in the last few months. Uh, um, first of all, like most academics, I'm used to travelling around a lot and I've certainly not been doing any of that. So I've... I've been getting to know Bristol a lot better, which is probably a good thing. Um, try to fit in a bit of exercise every day at one end or the other. But a lot of the day is spent in front of computers like this, of course, looking at people and talking to people. Um, and uh, if anything, I guess my main struggle is finding enough time to do the reading and writing that we really ne all need to do in the academic field in order to move our work forward. Um, because there's so much talking to be done and organizing to be done. Um, so yes, a typical day is, is much more <laughs> at home than, than before. I do go into the hospital, particularly because of the vaccine trial and supervising things there, but I've been able to, happily for me, my colleagues have been able to take over most of my clinical work, uh, caring for patients over this period to enable me to focus on the research. So I'm very grateful to them for doing that. Uh, and in fact, in pediatrics, we've been having a relatively quiet time because uh, children mercifully are not so severely affected by this uh, infection in most cases, though there are exceptions actually. We've had some seriously sick children, but relatively small numbers. Um, and other people are tending to stay away from hospitals. And in fact, keeping children at home stops them infecting each other with, 
with other infections. So we've seen fewer uh, in other infections going on uh, at the moment. So life's very different from normal, but uh, it's a new normal and uh, we're all adjusting to that. It sounds as if you're thriving on the challenge and I think we're, we're really lucky to have you in Bristol, so, so thank you. Can, can I ask you to talk a little bit about the, the sort of challenges that, that we will face now as we come out of lockdown and how, how science and research and research in Bristol can, can maybe help us with what will be the, hopefully the new normal when we do start getting out and about a little bit more? Yeah, I, this is, of course, this is about predicting the future. And this is the question that always gets asked and one always feels a bit nervous about doing it. But uh, yeah, I think we do have to look forward now as a university community to how we cope. Uh, and Hugh touched that on that before, you know, we, we really now need to engage with each other to use some of this research in practical ways to make, uh, to make life uh, workable for our, our community, our staff, our students and, and the city around us. Um, I, I think, uh, I, at least I hope, and I sincerely, uh, sincerely hope, really, that we don't see a recurrence of what happened in March. Um, uh, people talk a lot about a second wave, uh, but what happened in March was that there was uh, introduction of this infection before we were all prepared simultaneously in multiple places. And so we saw a massive epidemic occurring just about everywhere across the country. Going forward, I think it's more likely that we will see outbreaks and uh, we will see cases, but it's to be hoped that they will be localized and smaller scale and that we will be better equipped to recognize them and to deal with them as they occur. Uh, and so that we won't have this need for a, a massive sort of countrywide paralysis that, that we've had over the last two or three months. And I, I really hope that's what we can look forward to. I'm afraid we can't look forward to a, a, a normalization in any uh, com comprehensive way. Uh, but I would say that I think everybody has fundamentally, pretty much everyone's changed their behaviours and will continue to, to, to behave in a different way. Um, we were hearing just today some remarkable data from Australia, where of course they're now going into the winter, uh, and they're seeing the lowest uh, influenza epidemic that they, they've recorded in, in living memory. Now that can only be because People have changed their behavior, they're washing their hands, they're keeping apart, some of them are wearing masks and flu just can't, can't get around. It's, it's just not being transmitted. Yeah. Um, so, so that's a very powerful message that, that if you change your behavior, you can reduce transmission of infection. Uh, and I think we've all got to continue to do that uh, while normalizing our activities, our teaching, our research. We've got to do those extra precautions so that we can keep things under control or at least sufficiently well controlled that, that they, they can be dealt with uh, as we go along. And our job on the research side is to provide the, the tests, the support, the, the logistics to enable us to, to function in this new world where we have to recognize infection and deal with it uh, rapidly and uh, accurately. Yeah, great. So, so keep, keep washing our hands, I guess that's what, what you're saying. Too. <laughs> that's for sure. Can, can, can you talk a little bit about the tests? Because we hear a lot about the tests and I think there's a bit of a difference sort of opinion about whether the tests do, do what they, they, they say they should. Can you, can you help us with that? Yeah, sure. So, so there are two main types of tests. One is for the virus itself and the other is for antibodies, uh, usually measured in blood, although in Bristol we're focusing very much on measuring antibodies in saliva, which is a much less invasive sample to obtain, especially from children. For the virus test, um, uh, at the moment, most people are using a, a technique called polymerase chain reaction, or PCR for short. Uh, and the tests that were introduced in, in, back in March and April were, were really, really put together in a bit of a rush. And uh, although they were testing for the virus in a, a fairly uh, accurate way, they, they were often missing it, and uh, they were not perfectly designed. Um, and the labs that were doing the tests were really under a lot of pressure to just do tests and, and, and enable people to get diagnosed. In the university, we're in a better place to be able to stand back a bit and look carefully at these type of tests and see how we can improve them and make them more accurate. And ultimately, I think, make them more rapid and more accessible. Uh, and so we're well forward on the, on the way to doing that. And in fact, the university has just this uh, last week pledged very substantial resources to support the development of these tests uh, which are going on both in my lab and in the veterinary school labs down at Langford, so that we will be able to, to roll those out and make them available alongside the, the NHS and Public Health England laboratories 
for use by the university. Um, and I think there may also be uh, other new technologies coming through that we can, we can develop in parallel. So the university is really in a great place to be able to improve tests and get really good tests going. On the antibody side, uh, there are commercial tests being used very widely now in the NHS. A lot of staff are being tested um, and, and being told whether they have antibodies and therefore have been exposed. A lot of people discovering that they thought they had it and they actually don't have any antibodies. Uh, and some finding that they have antibodies and didn't realize that they'd had the infection. The problem with those tests though, is that they don't really tell you how well protected from getting it again you might be, or, or how long any such protection might last. And again, in the university, we're in a position to, thanks to our virologists, to really give some answers to those questions, to, to measure whether the antibodies that we're measuring in blood can actually neutralize the virus in a culture and, and, and stop it from infecting cells. Uh, and so I, I anticipate that we're going to be able to come up with with tests soon that will give much more insight into the protection. Um, and, and there are two arms to the immune system, the B cells that make antibodies, but the T cells, uh, independently of antibodies, also protect against viruses. And we're, we're also working very hard to understand how well that kind of protection works, which will be very important for the design of, of, of vaccines going forward, because we want vaccines that induce both T and B cell immunity. So yeah, lots and lots are going on with regard to testing. And I guess the message is that we in the universities are in a position, a privileged position really to, to get top quality answers to these kind of tests in a way that is very difficult for our colleagues working in the health service who are having to deliver in, on large scale uh, in real time. Uh, so we can work in partnership with them and really make a difference. Yeah, brilliant, great. And, and can we push you a bit to speculate on, on, the, on the vaccine trials? I know you don't have any results yet, but, but what do you think the prospect is for getting a vaccine? Well, I, I think it would be very surprising if we don't get one or more effective vaccines. The real question is, you know, will it be one of the first ones or will it be one of the later ones? Um, the evidence we've got with the vaccine from Oxford that we're currently trialing suggests that it will induce antibody responses for sure. Um, and in fact, within the next couple of weeks, we'll start getting information from the phase one study about that, not just whether there are antibodies in the blood of the people who've been immunized, but whether those antibodies are able to neutralize virus. So, you know, that's a first step. It's going to take longer, though, to figure out whether the vaccine actually protects against infection and, and illness. Um, we, I, in, I've been in discussion with Oxford because it's a particular interest of mine and I've persuaded them that we should be uh, actively doing surveillance in these uh, vaccine recipients looking for the virus regardless of whether they're sick or not yeah. because a vaccine that would interfere with transmission of infection would be enormously important. But ultimately whether the vaccine protects people against getting sick depends upon there being enough cases occurring in the people who received the vaccine or the controls who received a, a, a different vaccine uh, and seeing the difference between those two groups. And at the moment, we're seeing, of course, very few cases across the country. If we start to see outbreaks, then although that's a, a bad thing in many ways, it provides us with the opportunity to really find out whether the vaccine is doing its job. Um, but of course, there are other vaccines coming along behind. We're, we're already in discussion with Imperial, who have a vaccine. I've mentioned the Bristol vaccine, and then there are a number of uh, big manufacturers with candidate vaccines that we're talking to on a national scale, uh, Pfizer, Sanofi, uh, working with GSK, Janssen, and so on. So I, I think we're going to see a whole string of vaccine studies being set up over the rest of this year into next year, and it'll be extremely disappointing if one or more of those don't uh, at least do some good. Yeah. And, and, and I guess you probably would have a queue of people to join your, your vaccine trial if, if people could join, but, but other people will be worried about safety of vaccines. What, what, what thoughts do you have around, around those? Um, well, the, the main aim of the early phase studies is, is exactly that, is looking at safety. Um, before they even go into humans, we have to do safety studies in, uh, in animals. Um, uh, not only to check if the, the, the virus uh, is controlled by the vaccine, but also if those animals uh, come to any harm by receiving the vaccine, and indeed whether they are, uh, you, can, you can challenge an animal with the virus in the way that you can't so easily do in humans. 
Um, but uh, yes, the, first, the early phase studies are very much aimed at looking at safety and making sure that the people who receive the vaccine are not uh, affected in any adverse way. And of course, the people who volunteer to go into these studies are doing it in some respects in an altruistic way, yeah. uh, as all uh, subjects in research studies do, recognizing that uh, we, until we, we test these vaccines, we, we really can't be sure for certain that they're not in some way an unexpected way harmful or whether they work. Um, so, uh, you know, we very much recognize that people are doing this uh, fully informed of, of those potential risks. Having said that, the vaccines that we are developing are all based on previous vaccines that have been used before. Uh, so we, we don't go into this uh, in, in a lighthearted way um, and it's, it's done very carefully. Uh, and although the process has been speeded up massively compared to what we would normally do developing a vaccine, uh, that's not being done by cutting corners. It's been done by, uh, by really just getting things done very fast. Um, and going, you know, getting approvals that would normally take weeks or months in, in hours. Um, so I think we're taking all the normal steps that we would take, but the urgency of this uh, public health uh, crisis means that we have to move as fast as we possibly can. Yeah, brilliant, great. Th thanks again for everything, everything you're doing around this. So we'll, we'll open now for the Q&A. Um, and we've had a few sent in already. So Anu Ganapathy asks, um, about the, the possibility of collaboration to speed up that vaccine development. And what, what he's saying is, can an effective vaccine be developed earlier by a global collaboration between researchers uh, led by WHO or an independent body? Uh, yes, absolutely. And, and I think this is a really important message, uh, not only for the early phase of this, um, this uh, development program, but, but perhaps even more critically for the late phase um, we can't be developing vaccines for our own personal use in one country or another. This is not a race uh, where somebody wins uh, over someone else. Uh, this is a global problem and uh, it has to be seen that way. Uh, we, we need to be able to use vaccines once we have them uh, as effectively as possible to try and control this pandemic uh, where, they, where it's needed most. Uh, so collaboration, international collaboration is absolutely key. Uh, and uh, Hugh mentioned that my involvement with the WHO, both in the Euro region and, and actually the global level to try and coordinate that. But in terms of this particular question, uh, the, the, uh, the early stage development is already uh, an international collaborative effort. So we are seeing, for example, the Oxford vaccine, which has been started now, the trials in the UK is also going to be being trialed in in, uh, in Brazil very shortly. Uh, we're seeing uh, the vaccines that are being developed in the United States are coming to, the, uh, to Europe and to the United Kingdom for further trials. Um, and uh, uh, we're also hearing about developments in Asia, vaccines developed in, in China also being rolled out across that region. So we, we definitely need it to be an international and collaborative effort. Um, and uh, at the national level, we already have advanced talks working out uh, how we can spread out the, the workload of doing these trials uh, across the country. Uh, here in the West, we're already in discussions with our colleagues in Gloucester, in Swindon, in Bath, in Taunton, in Exeter, so that we can create a hub and spoke uh, um, uh, enlarged trial center, if you like, that doesn't just focus on Bristol, so that we can increase our capacity and speed. Uh, and that's being mirrored right the way across the country, and I, I believe right the way across the continent of Europe, so that uh, this is very much a joined up effort. Great, thank you. So, so Elizabeth Treadwell is asking about your, the previous fundamental biological work in viruses, and I guess also in vaccines. So how, how does this previous work um, help you with COVID and how does the COVID work help you with other viruses that we're all subject to? Okay, so the, uh, a very important question. I mean, I think the first and most obvious way in which being, uh, having already been working in this uh, coronavirus um, area helps us is that uh, these are highly pathogenic viruses and can't be, can't be uh, researched in, in any old laboratory. They, they, uh, my colleagues who are working uh, on the virus uh, in what's called a class three laboratory are literally using uh, a contained um, enclosed laboratory with an enclosure inside it 
where in order to handle and do the work that they're doing there, they're putting their arms into special gloves that, that they have to use so that everything is completely contained. Uh, and that being able to work under those uh, sort of circumstances in the, that way is not something that you can pick up overnight. It, it takes many years uh, to get those skills, to get the training and indeed to get the authorization to be allowed to, to handle these kind of pathogens. Uh, so that put us in an enormously uh, uh, advantageous position to get started on working on this virus, which we obtained almost immediately because we were one of the few labs capable of handling it. Uh, but the expertise goes beyond that because these viruses obviously have quite a lot in common in the way that they grow, the cells they grow in, uh, and the, the ways that you can manipulate them to understand their genetic code and their structure. So it gives you a head start if you're working with a, if you like, a cousin of the virus already uh, when it comes to understanding the, the, the new virus that you're, you're confronted with. Um, and uh, so I think all of those things helped us. In terms of the second part of the question, you know, how does this take us, uh, help us moving forward? I, I guess at the moment, we're really looking forward to better ways of being able to work with this virus and, and associated viruses um, right now. And in particular, trying to develop strains of the virus that are slightly less dangerous so that we can work uh, more broadly in a, in, a, in a less highly contained environment, but at the same time, do drug screening experiments and so on on a bigger scale. Um, but of course, uh, this whole experience right the way across the university is going to put us in a better place if and when, and hopefully it won't be soon, but if this sort of thing happens again in the future, um, and we're already uh, discussing expanding our virology capacity over the next year so that we are better equipped if this, uh, something like this happens again in the future. And, and, and we've, you, you've talked very much about, you, you know, the, the research that Bristol is doing that will help the world. But I know that a lot of the work and the expertise that you and your colleagues have have actually been helping the people of Bristol and actually the people of our university community. So Georgina's asking, uh, and I might ask you, and I might also ask you if he wants to come in, how will student halls of residence look in a post-COVID world? And, and, and how can your work help us manage our student population, help students get back to normal as, as quickly as possible? Absolutely, yes. I mean, we, we clearly need to make the uh, university a safe environment that uh, students are, uh, and their parents are, uh, are confident uh, in allowing their, their uh, in coming or allowing their children to come back uh, and study here. Um, and uh, although I'm not uh, directly involved in those adjustments there, uh, I, I'm certainly witness to the discussions that are going on around making the learning environment uh, safe and the, the living environment for students as well as for staff safe going forward. In terms of, um, uh, which will of course mean people essentially being further apart from each other than in the past um, and, uh, and taking extra precautions to reduce transmission, uh, hand washing, masks and so on and so forth. Uh, in terms of what we can do, um, the, the kind of testing uh, that, uh, that I was discussing earlier, which we can set up at scale and be immediately available to the university on campus, producing reliable tests that they can really trust, will potentially be very useful uh, going forward because it will uh, enable staff and students to have a clearer uh, picture of what's going on with the infection in, in our community as, as well as in the city around us. Um, uh, and it means that we can respond very rapidly, um, uh, as it were, in-house to any events that come up, any outbreaks that might occur. But we are also in very close conversation with Bristol City Council um, and aspects of the public health challenges they're facing uh, with the limited resources that exist uh, uh, at the moment to, to, uh, to test and to uh, to reopen things. Uh, in particular, we're focused on how we might be able to help with the, the vexed question of reopening schools. Parents are, are very concerned about this for very obvious reasons. Um, and uh, we need to be able to see if we can provide uh, or help provide a local solution to uh, making that easier, either in terms of monitoring for the virus. Uh, and we have various ideas about how that can be done efficiently and affordably. Uh, and also, as I mentioned, by looking particularly in staff who are probably at more risk, in fact, than students so for, for immunity and protection. Uh, and then going forward, if and when they become available by uh, implementing effective immunization programs as well. So I think there are a lot of things that we can do 
to improve uh, and to ameliorate the problems that we're, we're all facing. Hugh, I don't know if you want to come in at all and say what we're doing to keep our students safe specifically come September. Sure, and, um, and of course the safety of our students and staff has got to be the, the top priority. Um, so a, 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 a huge amount of work being done on this. Um, and of course, in a context of uncertainty. So, um, uh, and, and we have to make the, uh, you know, the best judgment we can in the face of the evidence available. Um, we're presuming that, um, well, we're making provision uh, should, should students coming from abroad, for example, still be required to quarantine uh, in October, uh, the, the term starts in October the, the 5th. Um, I, I, I strongly suspect that by then, presuming that the virus is going the right way in terms of suppression of the pandemic, um, I strongly suspect the quarantining will not be uh, required, but we have to at least make provi provision for that in our planning. Um, we're presuming that some level of distancing uh, will have to go um, um, uh, and, uh, with, of course, hand washing and, and, and the hygiene measures that uh, Adam mentioned. Um, big question, of course, is will it be two meters or one meters? Uh, and that's where, of course, the aerosol work is so important, the research that's going on in the university and, and uh, many countries and, uh, are, have already moved to, to one meter, often with face coverings. Um, and we'll be watching that closely because that certainly has implications for our estate. It has implications for how we um, uh, plan meals in halls of residence, so, you know, whether that's in shifts and, and distanced um, or for different types of meals. And then there is a concept which uh, other countries, uh, New Zealand, for example, have trialed of trying to create essentially um, households of students. So groups of 10 students, for example, who uh, you would consider being part of one household and then would be, uh, you would be comfortable with them being closer together, but would have to then maintain the distancing from, from, other, from other groups. Um, so that's something that, that we're, we're planning. We're calling them living, living circles. Uh, some universities and countries talk about them as bubbles. Um, but then even, even with all of that in place, I think um, Adam's work and our, our ability to, to track, uh, to, to test and, and, uh, and trace will be so important if we're going to give both students and staff the confidence that our campus is a safe place for them. And, and we just have to do that. So that's why we have invested in our own testing capacity to complement what's available through the NHS and public health. Great, that's, that's re really reassuring. And hopefully that uh, forthcoming students will, will be reassured by that. Adam, we're getting a few questions on the chat about uh, why COVID-19 affects different people differently. Uh, and one of the ones that was sent in uh, prior to, to you, you talking was about how we can boost our body defense against COVID-19. So, you know, clearly a vaccine will be great, um, but, but, but before then, why, why do some people um, seem to be particularly badly affected? And is there anything we can all do other than washing our hands, of course, to, to prevent us uh, getting a, a particularly bad infection? Uh, okay, so this is a very hard question to answer. There are clearly um, some, some, some predictors of, uh, of severe illness and the most, uh, the most clearly obvious one that everyone's aware of is age. It's a remarkable how, uh, how much more dangerous this virus is as you get older. Uh, and unfortunately for me, I'm already in the bracket where it becomes quite substantial in its risk uh, as compared to younger people, but it goes m much higher as you go through your 60s, 70s and 80s and so on. But the mechanism for that age dependent effect is still something of a mystery. Um, what I think we're really uh, recognizing uh, about this virus now, which was not apparent at the outset, is that it does far more than, say, influenza and the other respiratory viruses that predominantly affect uh, the lungs and the respiratory tract. This virus has capacity uh, tropisms for other organs of the body. It clearly affects the heart. It clearly affects uh, the, the, the kidneys. Uh, the blood vessels, blood clotting, uh, and there's now beginning to be uh, evidence to suggest that it may directly uh, affect the central nervous system, so produce neurological illness as well. Um, and I, I guess what it's going to turn out is that there are certain individuals or groups of individuals uh, in whom those different mechanisms are more likely to be manifest. Um, 
But, you know, that's a, a general uh, explanation and the precise uh, reasons why we're seeing these differences is, are, are yet really to be understood. In Bristol, we're very much focusing on the, um, uh, on the immune responses and trying to understand how the inflammatory immune responses affect the protective immune responses by studying that in some detail. And that might give us some insights into this. Uh, but I can also say that uh, there are uh, colleagues in, in biochemistry in the uh, biosynthetic uh, labs who, who have the capacity to really study the, the proteins that make up the virus in great detail, right down to the angstrom level, to, to look at uh, using cryo-electron microscopy at the structure of the viral proteins, are beginning to give us insights into how this virus actually is so damaging to cells. Um, and uh, may be causing these kind of injuries. And if uh, it's at that molecular level of understanding that we really probably will make progress. If we can really get to grips with how this virus makes such a mess of human cells when it gets into them, we may begin to be able to design ways of preventing that from happening and understanding why some individuals get so much sicker than others. Okay, great, good. Uh, and it must be really good to be able to integrate that with all the other research that's going on. So the, the, the kind of sum, I guess, is greater than the, the, all the parts. One of the questions coming up is, is where, what about the origins of the virus? Do we know now where it, where it came from? Um, and, and if it is an animal a virus in the first place, how did it get into humans? So I, I don't think that uh, there have been any really uh, convincing advances beyond the original um, observations that it will have emerged in humans almost certainly in the latter part of last year uh, and that will almost certainly have happened in uh, in that particular area of China in Wuhan. Um, I think some of the uh, speculation or the evidence around bats and pangolins and so on uh, are not entirely conclusive um, and, and whether it really was at that particular wet market that it it all began. Uh, is, is under question by some, uh, but it, it does seem likely that that's where things kicked off. Having said that, there are one or two reports in the literature suggesting that there may be these anomalous earlier cases uh, that existed before. So there may be more to learn about this. Um, and we've certainly uh, learned in the past that uh, our initial assumptions about new viruses that emerge in the human population uh, turn out to be more complicated than we originally thought, uh, and HIV being an example in point. Um, but uh, nevertheless, uh, it, it does seem to be a virus that's most likely come across into our species in the, in the really relatively recent past, and that would fit with the pandemic picture that we're seeing with with it uh, uh, with these very big outbreaks occurring just about everywhere where it, it, it comes in. Uh, so yes, maybe some more information on that in the future, but for the moment that seems to be the picture. In terms of uh, the UK, I, I think what we are learning is that there was virus in this country before anybody really realised. Uh, it was coming in in large numbers of cases. It wasn't a single person kind of went on a ski holiday. It was, it was actually uh, around. Um, and actually we're going to be able to contribute to understanding that very soon because as it happens, we were doing a study in school-age kids um, uh, looking for a carriage of a bacterium that causes meningitis. And that included collecting swabs from about uh, 14, 1500, 16-year-olds around the country in February and March. And we're, we're just about to analyze those in the lab and see whether we were finding the virus. And we'll be able to genotype it in the way I was describing earlier. So we can contribute to the understanding of the early part of the epidemic in the UK at any rate. Okay, great, thank you. And, and let's say we get to, to next year and there is a, there is a vaccine. Who, 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 how do you think that will be used? Because presumably this, people will be, have to be prioritised in terms of their, their um, or vaccine administration. Yes, yeah. so, so um, the, the JCVI, that's the committee I sit on for the UK that decides on vaccine policy, usually of course talking about children mm. because most vaccines are given to children, but in this case uh, adults are already beginning to discuss that, uh, even though we don't yet have a vaccine and know how well it would work in different age groups. Uh, what's clear already, I think, and, and I think is already public knowledge, and if it isn't, it would be no, no surprise to anyone, is that the, the, the first uh, priority for any vaccine will be 
for the frontline workers who need to be protected in order to be able to maintain health services and other essential services that, that kind of keep society going. Uh, so those will be absolutely first in line. And I think there's an absolute unanimity of opinion around that. Um, but beyond that, it's about trying to understand the particular vaccine and how well it works in order to decide how to prioritize its use. The logical thing would be to give the vaccine to older people, uh, particularly very old people, because they're at such enormously high risk of getting seriously ill and dying. But on the other hand, if you don't have evidence that the vaccine is effective in that age group, then uh, there's very little point in, in using it. Uh, and you might be better off uh, immunizing the people that are caring for and looking after those individuals uh, so to indirectly protect them, if you like. Uh, so all of that gets a bit more tricky. Um, and as we understand the risk factors that predict serious illness, that may influence the policy. And then finally, if you get a vaccine that influences transmission in the way I was mentioning earlier, then that changes everything again. Because if, for example, we discover that really what drives the, 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 the epidemic is, is, is uh, transmission between young people, you might really be able to protect everybody by stopping them from infecting each other. So, so there are some difficult questions there, but it, it, the, 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 the clear answer is that frontline workers in every sector where we, we really need to have people still, uh, still active and, and, and protecting us and helping us and supporting us, those people need to be protected first. Okay, great. Um, and, and Stephen's ask, asking about viral mutation and its impact on, on vaccines. So with the flu vaccine, that changes every year, doesn't it, depending on the, on the, on the particular flu virus. Is that likely to be a risk with COVID-19 or do you think it will be sufficiently stable that if we get a vaccine, it will, it will work forever? Uh, it's a six million dollar question, if not a six billion dollar question. Um, well, for the first thing to say is that we already know that this virus is, is genetically unstable. And, and in fact, that's the, 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 it's that fact that we can use in order to track and trace it, uh, the different strains. There are at least 21 different uh, strains of the virus already circulating in the UK uh, at the moment. Um, the way that we can potentially protect ourselves against this virus evolving away from the vaccines that we've got is by including in the vaccines the critical parts of the virus that it would find very difficult to change. In other words, those bits that enable the virus to bind to our cells and find a way in in order to cause the infection. Uh, and there's a lot known about the spike protein which is on the surface of the virus and the receptor binding domain, which is sometimes being called now the Achilles heel of the virus, in the sense that it really has to have that part of the protein in working in the way that it does in order to bind to the angiotensin converting enzyme two that is the receptor on the human cells. So as long as the, 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 the vaccines contain that particular part, it's reasonably likely that the immunity against that particular part will be protected because the virus just won't be able to change that. Of course, there's no total guarantee of that and we could end up in a flu virus type situation, uh, but we're all uh, fervently hoping that that doesn't happen. Okay, great. Um, and, and this may be the last question, um, Adam. Um, you're a paediatrician at, at heart. The, the question here is about emerging reports of autoimmune disease activation uh, particularly in children. Uh, do you have any thoughts, thoughts about that um, and, and what, what we can do about that? Yes, yeah, so, so very much so. The, these cases of uh, uh, different actually uh, overlapping syndromes that we actually do see in children from time to time um, called Kawasaki syndrome and also toxic shock syndrome uh, have emerged quite late in the first wave of the uh, epidemic in children where there wasn't always uh, firm evidence that they'd actually had the infection. But the, the emerging consensus is that this is indeed uh, a problem that's being triggered in a small minority of children uh, by the virus, and that it is indeed uh, probably a, uh, a consequence of their immune response to the virus uh, that is in those cases making them sick. It's actually attacking their own blood vessels and, and uh, other organs. Uh, the, the only good thing one can say about this is that it does seem to be pretty rare. Um, okay. And in fact, although there have been deaths, most of these children, although seriously ill, have been making 
a, a good recovery. So it's, it's an extremely worrying development, uh, but it's, 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 it's a rare problem. Uh, and in most cases, children are, are coming through. Um, but we urgently need to understand this problem to uh, understand who's at risk and what, what it is, again, that's making this happen. And of course, again, going back to the issue of vaccine safety, we need to make sure that whatever these immune responses are in these individuals that are causing these problems are not immune responses that we induce with our vaccines. Otherwise, we may have an effective vaccine, but which in a small minority of people cause serious illness. And we, so we, we really do need to make an effort to unravel this question for that reason as well. So it's, 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 it might sound like a, a small problem in the context of the vast uh, uh, disease uh, epidemic we're seeing and the many, many, many deaths in, in adults and older people, but it's still a serious worry and uh, something that we, we do need to investigate intensively and understand. Okay, good. Thank, thank you very much. I, th I think that's probably all we have time for today, so I'll, I'll maybe just wrap up. There's been lots, there've been lots of really good questions, and I'm really sorry if we didn't get a chance to um, answer everybody's questions, uh, but, but huge thanks for submitting them. Um, if, if you have questions that we didn't answer, please do email them in to alumni-events-bristol.ac.uk, uh, and we'll endeavour to answer those for you offline. Um, huge thanks to both uh, Adam Finn and our Vice Chancellor Hugh Brady for joining us today. Uh, I think we had a really interesting session. I, I've really enjoyed it. And thank you so much for all our alumni and, and other friends for tuning in. Um, I know that we're all really proud of uh, the amazing work that, that you're doing, Adam, and really grateful to you for, for giving up some of your such precious time to talk to us today. Uh, and please pass on our thanks to the other researchers who are working with you that I know that you would want to, to thank and recognize. Um, thank you again to all our alumni and friends for, for all the outpouring of support and, and help and community spirit that you have shown. Uh, we will be logging off in a minute, um, but for anybody who wants to stay on, please do so. And, and there's an opportunity to chat to your fellow alumni through the, the chat system. That seems to be the closest we can get to anybody these days. So, so please do make, make use of that. Um, but thank you again for joining. Thank you again to Adam and Hugh for, for joining us and, and for all your time. Uh, please do keep in touch, stay safe and stay well and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you very much.